over the years, hybrid vehicles, especially Toyota's hybrid vehicles, have gotten a bit of a bad rap. They've been accused of being a little bit too boring, a little bit too expensive, not really saving you any money in the long run, etc. But this hybrid right here is a very different kind of hybrid. If you're shopping for a compact crossover in America, the all-new Toyota RAV4 Hybrid is quite simply one of the best crossovers that you can buy. And if you're looking for a Toyota RAV4, I honestly can think of very little reason to buy the regular version. I think everybody should be buying this hybrid model right here. And that's why a number of months ago, we ordered our very own Toyota RAV4 Hybrid for a long-term video review series. Hopefully, it will be in our hot little hands by the end of August 2019, so we can run it through our battery of comparisons and do a lot of direct one-on-one -on -one videos, RAV4 Hybrid versus CX-5, RAV4 Hybrid versus CRV, etc. But in this video, we're going to do our usual format, and we're going to talk specifically about the hybrid and how it compares to the rest of the competition, why you might want it, why you might not want it, and why I think that this is one of the best crossovers in America right now. With this generation of the RAV4, the hybrid system is no longer limited to just the top end trims. You can now get the hybrid system in the base Ellie trim and every other trim in the RAV4 lineup except the off-road oriented adventure grade. And the hybrid system is a very minor bump in MSRP. It's only an $800 add-on to the all-wheel drive gasoline version. That is important to remember. A lot of outlets there are saying that the hybrid version is $1,800 more expensive than the regular RAV4. That's not true. It's $1,800 more expensive than the front-wheel drive RAV4. RAV4. Compared to an all-wheel drive RAV4, the hybrid system only adds $800. Now, because the hybrid system is available in all the various trims, we have some different looks up front. The model that we're driving right now is the XSE grade, which is supposed to be the sportier version of the RAV4, so we get a slightly different front-end look. But again, the hybrid system is not available in the adventure grade trim, which has sort of Toyota's mini truck front end. I think that's a little bit of a pity. I would love to have seen that particular front end on the hybrid model. A number of years ago, Toyota really decided to push the envelope when it comes to active safety in America. And almost every new Toyota sold in America for 2019 and 2020 will have their latest suite of active safety technologies standard in every model, not just upper end trims like we see in most of the competition. And that includes the Toyota RAV4. In even the base LE trim, we get autonomous braking with pedestrian detection, radar adaptive cruise control, auto high beams, and lane keeping assistant. It's worth noting that competitors may have autonomous braking in their base models, but they generally won't have pedestrian detection or adaptive cruise control in those models, and you will find that in even the LE trim of the RAV4. Now, if you want blind spot monitoring, that is extra. It is standard on XLE and above, and if you want backup sensors with autonomous braking, then you'll have to get all the way up to the limited trim. From the outside, there's very little to differentiate the hybrid from the non-hybrid model. They look essentially the same from the side profile. We just have a little hybrid badge right there. At 180.9 inches long, the RAV4 and the RAV4 Hybrid are very middle of the road for this segment overall. This is almost exactly the same length as the upcoming all-new Ford Escape. We will have a video on that coming up over the next few weeks. For 2020, the only hybrids available in this segment will be the all-new Ford Escape and this all-new Toyota RAV4, but they go after their hybrid mission a little bit differently, and we'll definitely touch on that a little bit later in this video. A common complaint about the previous generation RAV4 was that it was a little bit too close to the ground, but things are very different in this generation. We now have 8.1 inches in the hybrid and 8.4 to 8.6 if you choose the non-hybrid model. So as you can see, even though the hybrid has a slight reduction over the other versions, it still is significantly higher off the ground than the last model. With the RAV4, Toyota definitely decided to play it safe when it comes to overall style, although there are still a few elements that are quite distinctive, like these tail lamp modules that stick out quite far from the body. Personally, I think that the Mazda CX-5 is by far the most beautiful entry in this segment. It definitely is better looking to my eye than the Toyota RAV4, but they don't really have anything that competes with this particular hybrid model. Down here at the bottom, we get dual exhaust tips, which is a really nice touch, and again, a pretty discreet hybrid badge on the back. Continuing the no compromises theme, not only is the RAV4 Hybrid the most efficient RAV4 in America, it's also the most powerful, giving us 219 horsepower combined. 176 horsepower comes from the 2.5 liter four cylinder engine. The rest comes from the battery pack courtesy of the electric motors. Toyota does not give us an official torque measurement for their hybrid system, but I suspect this is somewhere between 200 and 220 pound feet based on the overall performance of the vehicle. That's a pretty decent bump over the non-hybrid version. And most of that torque happens at low RPMs thanks to the electric motor design. For many folks out there, of course, the big deal under this hood is not gonna be the power, but the fuel economy. 40 miles per gallon combined is what we get out of this drivetrain as compared to 28 to 30 in the regular model. 
When looking at hybrids in this segment, it's important to remember that there is a fundamental difference between this all-wheel drive hybrid system and the all-wheel drive hybrid system we find available in the Ford Escape Hybrid that's all new for 2020 and the Nissan Rogue Hybrid system that is no longer going to be sold in America for 2020. The Ford and the Nissan use a mechanical all-wheel drive system. It's essentially identical to the non-hybrid versions of those vehicles with a mechanical connection to the rear axle, a true differential in the rear sending power to the rear wheels. The RAV4 Hybrid, very much like the rest of Toyota's hybrid all-wheel drive lineup, uses a separate electric motor in the back, so there's no physical connection between the front and the rear axles. The rear electric motor in this vehicle is capable of delivering 54 horsepower and 89 pound-feet of torque. The electric rear axle results in a very different feel overall for this all-wheel drive system than the average mechanical all-wheel drive system in this category. However, Toyota has really gone back to the drawing board and seriously improved the software, so this all-wheel drive system definitely seems to perform better out on the trail than the previous generation of the RAV4 Hybrid, but it can never send quite as much power to the rear axle as it can to the front, never quite as much power to the rear axle as a RAV4 with the regular all-wheel drive system. But on the flip side, this electric rear axle is part of the reason that the RAV4 can get us 40 miles per gallon combined. You won't get that same kind of real-world fuel economy in any of the competition. I rate front seat comfort at 9 out of 10 points. I found this seat design very comfortable overall, even though it's not quite as adjustable as some of the competition. The big omission here is that we don't have a four-way adjustable lumbar support in any trim at all. It's also worth noting that unlike some of the American options, we don't have the same range of motion for the passenger seat. So if you want a passenger seat with adjustable lumbar support, some of those higher end features, you will have to shop elsewhere. But overall, the seat design is pretty comfortable for my body shape, and we have a tilt telescopic steering column with a pretty decent range of motion for this group. Hopping into the back seat, you will find less room than some of the competition. We have 78.8 inches of combined legroom in the RAV4, and that is below the Nissan Rogue, the Honda CRV, and the Subaru Forester. You will definitely notice the difference if you try and put rear-facing child seats back here versus putting rear-facing child seats in the Subaru or the Nissan. You'll definitely find those more accommodating. But this is still more than capable of handling for adults. I still have a decent amount of headroom, about two inches or so, even though the battery pack for the hybrid system is located under the rear bench seat. Moving over to the middle seat, I still have about an inch of headroom left, even though the middle seat is higher off the ground than the outboard seating positions, and this model has the optional panoramic moonroof, which does cut down on overall headroom. If I scoot all the way over to the right, this front seat is all the way back in its tracks. You can see I have about two inches of legroom left. Definitely less than we'll find in the Rogue CRV or Forester, but still definitely acceptable for adults. The rear seats feature a two-stage recline mechanism. It's actuated by the same handle that folds the seats forward. That adds a little bit of extra comfort. And the rear seats fold almost completely flat with the cargo area in the back. Even though the battery pack is located right there under the rear seats, you really will never notice it because the overall feel of the interior, the way the seats fold, the way they feel, and the cargo area in the back is essentially identical to the non-hybrid model. Another nice touch here is that we get a fold-down center armrest that's thickly padded, and the center seat belt position comes out of the seat back itself, not out of the ceiling like we do find in some of the competition. That means that if you're using the center seat belt to lock a child seat into place, it's gonna really be in the center of the seat back. It's not gonna be skewed to one side. And we also have a cargo area in the back that's more square as a result. Behind the rear hatch, we find the exact same 37.5 cubic feet of storage space back here that we find in the non-hybrid RAV4. That's a pretty big difference between this and something like the Mitsubishi Outlander if you want to compare this to that particular plug-in hybrid. That's not a regular hybrid, it's a plug-in, and as a result of the plug-in system, you do lose some cargo area in the back. Although the inside of the RAV4 appears to be a little bit tighter than the last generation RAV4, especially when it comes to combined rear seat room, they've managed to keep the cargo area pretty consistent in terms of overall size. This is definitely on the larger end of the compact crossover segment, and it also is very square and accommodating, meaning that we can put about the same kind of roller bags back here that we can in larger entries like the Nissan Rogue. Because Toyota locates the hybrid battery pack under the rear seats rather than in the cargo area, we still have room for a donut spare tire back here, and it looks like you might even be able to squeeze a full-size spare tire if you wanted to do that aftermarket. However, it's worth noting that this dual position load floor would not be able to scoot to its lower position. I can slide that out right like that and slide it down if you were to put a full-size spare tire in there. But again, if you're willing to sacrifice that, I suspect a full-size would fit. 
As we look around the interior, keep in mind that we are in the XSE trim, which is not quite the top end model, but it is considered the sportier trim. So things are a little bit different in here than the model that we've ordered, which is the XLE. The driver and front passenger get height adjustable shoulder belts and two way adjustable headrests. The XSE trim gets this imitation leather upholstery with the blue stitching right there on the seat shoulders. And then this somewhat unusual pattern for the inserts on the seat bottom and seat back cushion. Looking at it very closely, you'll notice that it is also imitation leather, but it has the these blue stripes embroidered in it with matching thread to what we see on the seat back and sides. With this generation of the RAV4, Toyota really decided to improve their interior game, so we find much more premium materials on the front doors. You'll find matching stitching right there at the top of the door, and then as we work our way down the door, we find a lot of soft touch materials, including a soft touch armrest. And then Toyota continues those soft touch materials and the stitched components as we work our way over to the dashboard. We have a soft touch injection molded upper section of the dashboard right there, a little bit of accent trim, and then this stitched middle component. On the passenger side, we have a little storage cubby where you can easily put larger smartphones and there's a little rubbery grip at the bottom to keep them from sliding around. It can be removed to be cleaned more easily. And then we have a moderately sized bin style glove compartment. I was not able to fit a large tablet computer inside. In the middle of the dashboard, we have the color touchscreen infotainment system. And as you can see, Toyota has finally realized that resistance is futile and they've given in to smartphone integration. All versions of the RAV4 you find on the dealer lots right now will have Apple CarPlay. And we're told that by the end of 2019, perhaps even shipping already right now, we will have Android Auto support for the first time. Toyota has not been incredibly specific about this, but I suspect anybody that's purchased a 2019 RAV4 without Android Auto support will be able to get a software update to be able to support that. So if you already have a RAV4 and that's something that you're worried about, be sure and check with your dealer later this year. Overall, the software is pretty familiar if you've seen any recent Toyota product. We have our pretty typical home screen right there, some physical buttons on each side, a power and volume knob, and a tune and scroll knob on the other side. Depending on the trim level, you can get factory navigation in this system. And there are also some vehicle integrated apps. Unfortunately, because I'm running Apple CarPlay, we can't see those right there via that app button. As we work our way down the dashboard, we find more of those premium stitched materials right there, dual zone automatic climate control, a button to turn off the traction control, heated seat switches high and low. We don't get ventilated seats in this particular trim, although they are available in the RAV4. Below that, we have a 12 volt power port, single USB input and auxiliary input, a Qi wireless charging mat that is optional. And then we get the shifter and controls for the hybrid system. The shifter is a pretty traditional console design. We pull all the way back to there for drive. Sport mode is over to the left. We then push away from the driver for gear up, pull towards the driver for gear down. You'll see that there is a little bit of a manual mode indication right there. Personally, I think that's a little bit silly because this hybrid system doesn't, of course, have stepped ratios. It can infinitely vary the effective ratio between engine and tires, but it also does not use a traditional CVT either. Over here, we have the electric parking brake button, auto brake hold enable disable, a trail mode, eco mode, sport mode, and then we push this down for normal. You'll see that it changes colors depending on the mode that we're in. The drive modes mainly relate to the way the throttle mapping is done for the electronic throttle, but trail mode also encourages the vehicle to send a little bit more power to the rear axle than normal. And then down there at the bottom, we get the EV mode switch. As you'd expect out of a car in North America, we have two large cup holders right here between the driver and front passenger seats. No cover on those. We have a softly padded center armrest right there that opens to reveal a pretty decently sized storage area. We get two USB charge only ports. And these are high current ports, so they do support a 2.1 amp charge per port. The biggest difference on the inside versus the non-hybrid model is gonna be this gauge over here on the left. Instead of a tachometer, we get this power eco and charge gauge, which is pretty typical among hybrid vehicles. We then have a fuel gauge over here on the right and the engine temperature gauge. Then everything else is being delivered by a color LCD in the middle. The display is not as configurable as some, but it does change based on the drive mode. So if I put it in trail, you'll see very subtly it turns gray right there, that ring, and then we get the little rocks at the bottom. If I put it in eco, it turns green. If I put it in sport, it turns red. This displays where you can adjust certain vehicle settings, mainly relating to the way the autonomous safety systems behave in the vehicle. We can also get trip computer readouts, quick status of some of the vehicle's active safety systems, and then of course, some additional gauges and fuel economy readouts. The steering wheel is an attractive three spoke design. We have a split spoke down there at the bottom and sport grips up top. You'll find the controls for the radar adaptive cruise control over here on the right. Again, this is a standard system in all RAV4s, including the base model. You set the distance with this button, turn on and off the lane keeping assistance system with that one. They've split the infotainment buttons on each side. So we have a mode and track forward backward button over here on the right, 
volume up, down, and voice command over here on the left. There's also a phone button, and then this button bank coordinates to that multifunction LCD. So we change options using those buttons right there like that. Thanks to that low-end torque, acceleration definitely benefits from the hybrid system. This particular model went 0 to 60 in 7.5 seconds, and the last RAV4 non-hybrid model we tested took 8.8 .8 seconds to accomplish that same task. The big difference you'll really notice is in the 0 to 30 time, again thanks to the torque, because this is almost a full second faster 0 to 30 than the RAV4 Adventure we last tested. Now, unfortunately, when it comes to handling, the hybrid system does give up a little bit because we don't have the torque vectoring axle we find in the RAV4 Adventure or in the other top-end model of the RAV4. In our braking test, this model went from 60 miles an hour back to zero in 131 feet. This particular model was a little bit quicker stopping than the RAV4 Adventure. I know that some outlets out there have said that the RAV4 Hybrid was a little bit longer than the other models. We unfortunately have not had the ability to zero to 60 test officially a standard XSE or a standard XLE model to compare it with this one, and the Adventure Grade model does have slightly different equipment. It's also possible that Toyota has tweaked the braking software a little bit between the pre-production models that a lot of outlets are testing and this particular model, which is a full production 2019 RAV4. Perhaps the biggest difference you'll notice between this and the regular gasoline models of the RAV4 when it comes to overall braking is that this does have the same behavior that we see in other Toyota hybrid products, where if you transition from moderate or mild braking to heavy braking, then there does seem to be just a little bit of a delay. It feels a little bit unusual at first, but you're definitely going to get used to that if you were to buy one. And then the last thing that you should be aware of is that we don't get as much effective engine braking in the hybrid vehicle as we seem to find in the non-hybrid RAV4. Even if we put this over here into the sport mode where it is going to use the engine in a more mechanical fashion to help slow you down, we don't get quite as much of that engine braking as we see in the regular model. When it comes to handling, I'm going to give the RAV4 Hybrid an A-. This does not handle quite as well as the regular versions of the RAV4. That's because we don't have the torque vectoring rear axle in the back that you would get in the top-end trims of the gasoline-only model. But even if you were to compare this to an XSE model, which does not get the torque vectoring axle in the regular non-hybrid model, that is still going to handle a little bit better than this because at those higher speeds, it can send more power to the rear. And this electric rear axle does disconnect at higher speeds. As I said earlier in the video, Toyota has made some serious improvements to the way that the electric rear axle behaves in the RAV4, and that's really obvious when we get this out on a trail like we're on here. I'm just gonna stop, we're on a decent slope here, and if I lay into the throttle a little bit, we definitely get some front wheel slip, but we also get a lot more power to the rear than we had in the regular RAV4. If I were to be more gentle on the throttle, you'll really see the difference. For instance, we don't really get much slip there if I really control the throttle myself and scoot on up. That's because we get a decent amount of torque to the rear motor. And at those low RPMs, you're not gonna see too much of a torque difference between this and the regular version of the RAV4. We can get about 90 pound-feet of torque to the rear axle. In a regular RAV4 at low RPM, say 1500, 1600 RPM, you're not really gonna be getting much more than about 150 pound-feet of torque overall, splitting that front and rear. It's gonna be pretty similar. The biggest difference is that the rear axle and the front axle are not necessarily going to be spinning at the same rate. And in vehicles that are in this category where you can command a lock of the center coupling, you can get that to happen. So they do feel a bit more sure-footed. Again, in situations like this spot right here where there are leaves on the ground, you'll definitely get some front wheel scrabble and then the rear tires will dig in. But whatever the condition out there, you will definitely notice the difference between this and the previous generation RAV4 Hybrid. When it comes to our overall ride score, I'm going to give this an A-. You will find a more compliant ride in something like a Subaru Forester or a Jeep Cherokee. But remember that the RAV4 is designed to be more of an on-road vehicle than either of those two options. Those are really targeting someone that's going to go off-road a little bit more frequently. So I think this is overall a pretty good balance between ride and handling. Back to the traction for a moment, you'll really notice as we're climbing up some of these areas here that we have a very sure-footed feel overall for the RAV4. This feels very much like the average compact crossover. Now, clearly this is not an off-road focused compact crossover. This is not gonna be a Jeep Trailhawk or anything along those lines. This is not gonna be a Jeep Wrangler, but this is going to perform very, very well when pitted against a Mazda CX-5 or a Honda CRV or any of the other mainstream entries in this compact crossover segment. Now, this is not gonna be quite as capable when the going gets really sticky as something like the Rogue Hybrid, which used a traditional mechanical all-wheel drive system or the upcoming Ford Escape Hybrid, 
which also uses a traditional mechanical all-wheel drive system. But most folks that are shopping in this segment are never really going to encounter an, a situation where those systems would be necessary. Even around corners like this on rutted pavement, there's a pretty big rut over here on the right side. You can see that the RAV4 just tackles that very easily. And you won't really have a problem in snow or sleet or ice or any of those situations. In our cabin noise test at 50 miles an hour, we ended up at 72 decibels in here, making this a little bit louder than some of the options. So I'm gonna give this a B when it comes to overall cabin noise. But obviously we need to talk about fuel economy next because that is exactly what the RAV4 Hybrid is all about. And we've been averaging just over 40 miles per gallon over a week of mixed driving. And remember that my commute takes me up and over a 2200 foot mountain pass. We've been filming this vehicle. We've taken it on this off-road path here a few times we get absolutely excellent fuel economy in the RAV4, significantly higher fuel economy in real world mixed driving than we found in the Rogue Hybrid. We don't have official fuel economy numbers for the Escape Hybrid yet. I suspect that the front wheel drive version is probably going to be pretty close to what we're driving here, but the all wheel drive version is likely going to be lower because again, it does use a true mechanical all wheel drive system. And if you're looking for a hybrid in this segment with the absolute best traction, that's gonna be the option that you're gonna to wanna to look at. Bottom line, out on the road for the RAV4 Hybrid, there are certainly more pros than cons going on to get this over the non-hybrid version. You do give up a little bit when it comes to handling and a little bit when it comes to the braking score, but we get a significantly improved zero to 60 time. And for a lot of folks, that is gonna be reason enough to choose the hybrid over the non-hybrid model. And then for the rest of you, you're gonna be getting 10 to 15 miles per gallon better fuel economy in real world driving. According to the EPA, you should be getting between 10 and 12, but for most folks out there, especially if you're doing a lot of slow and go or stop and go traffic, this is going to be even more efficient than the regular RAV4 hybrid. In stop and go traffic, this could be 20 miles per gallon better. Some of you out there may dislike the way this hybrid system feels when you first get in the vehicle, but I suspect that most folks will be quickly won over by the faster acceleration time. The important thing to remember about the RAV4 hybrid pricing is that all wheel drive is standard on all hybrid models. There is a front wheel drive hybrid RAV4 available elsewhere in the world, but for some reason, Toyota chose not to bring that to America. So all the hybrid models we get here are going to have their e all wheel drive system. That's very important when comparing prices to the competition or prices to other RAV4 models, because on the surface of things, it would appear that the hybrid is $2,200 more than the non-hybrid, but in reality, it's only an $800 bump over the comparable non-hybrid, if that makes sense, because the comparable non-hybrid would have all-wheel drive. There are two other important things to keep in mind with the RAV4. The first one is that it seems to be pretty thin on the ground. Toyota's really struggling to meet demand for the RAV4 hybrid. It's selling better than Toyota ever thought possible. In fact, in Australia, for instance, the RAV4 Hybrid is outselling the non-hybrid model, and that was not something that Toyota had expected. So they're having production troubles trying to keep up with the RAV4 Hybrid. So if you want one, you may need to be a little bit patient. You'll also need patience if you want a specific trim, because even though the hybrid system is available in every trim except the adventure trim, you may have difficulties finding the exact trim and exact options that you want on the dealer lot for the hybrid model. You may have to order it like we did here at Alex and Autos. Again, we have ordered a RAV4 hybrid here for a long-term test, but it has taken quite a long time because it did have to be ordered from the factory to meet the exact specifications that we wanted. Hopefully it will be here sometime around the end of August. We just don't know yet. Personally, my favorite hybrid trim is gonna be the XLE with all of the option packages. I think that's really where the sweet spot is for the RAV4 hybrid. That ends up at $33,335. The big deal for the RAV4 Hybrid is the chart that you see on your screen now. It's the operational costs for the hybrid model. I said before that the RAV4 Hybrid system is a no compromises hybrid because we don't get any reduction in interior space and we get better performance than we find in the non-hybrid model. But in other ways, you could look at the hybrid system as being beyond a no compromises hybrid, just being quite simply the better drivetrain to get. Not only do we get that improved performance, but we get significantly reduced operational costs as you can see on your screen right here. The numbers you see on your screen are from the EPA website and they're based on 15,000 miles a year of driving according to the EPA blend of city and highway driving. The important thing to remember here is that in real world driving situations, especially if you do a lot of stop and go or slow and go traffic or a lot of in city driving, your delta between the hybrid model and the rest of the competition on the screen is going to be even bigger because the hybrid system is likely still going to be giving you that 40 MPG score, regardless of whether you're doing a lot of slow and go traffic or not. Whereas something like uh, the Tiguan all wheel drive or a Hyundai Tucson, 
Those fuel economy numbers are really going to drop in those slow and go driving situations when you're in heavy traffic out on the highway. But the bigger deal on this chart would be when comparing the RAV4 Hybrid against some of the competition, especially entries like the Hyundai Tucson, which is not terribly efficient when equipped with all-wheel drive. It only gets 23 mpg regardless of the engine that you get in that particular model. And that means that depending on exactly how you have the Tucson and the RAV4 Hybrid equipped, you could pay for the RAV4 Hybrid's extra MSRP in about a year. The bottom line here is that whether you're buying or leasing a RAV4 Hybrid, you will see real fuel economy savings. And if you're going to keep your vehicle long term, know that the RAV4 Hybrid is likely going to be one of the most reliable entries in this particular segment. The hybrid system operates on the same basic principles that we see in the Toyota Prius, and the Toyota Prius is time after time after time one of the most reliable vehicles in America. The reason is that the hybrid system is really very, very simple. The actual mechanics of the way the hybrid system works is pretty basic, a lot less complicated than the average automatic transmission. And that's one of the reasons that we see such reliable hybrids out of Toyota, out of Ford, and out of General Motors. They all share that same basic hybrid design. So if you plan on keeping your vehicle for 10 years or 150 or perhaps even 200,000 miles, the RAV4 Hybrid is most likely going to be considerably less expensive than the rest of the competition. Over 150,000 miles at today's gas prices, you should expect to save at least five to six thousand dollars versus the regular RAV4 all-wheel drive. And that delta will expand to incredible numbers if gasoline went up to three dollars and fifty cents a gallon, like it happens to be in California at this very moment right now. Uh, at three fifty a gallon over ten years, something like the Hyundai Tucson would cost you ten thousand dollars more than the RAV4, and that's before we dive into expected maintenance and repair costs. With that out of the way, let's talk about the lack of competition. At the moment, the RAV4 Hybrid really is standing alone. We have the Mitsubishi Outlander plug-in hybrid, but it's not quite the same sort of thing. It's a little bit bigger. The plug-in hybrid system is really not terribly efficient. Not a huge fan of the Outlander plug-in hybrid, to be perfectly honest. We have the upcoming expected CRV hybrid. We don't know when that will come to the US. It's already on sale in Europe and in some other world markets, but for some reason, we don't get it here. And at the moment, that's basically it, because Nissan has killed off the Nissan Rogue Hybrid. So since there's no direct competition at the moment, let's instead talk about the RAV4's pros and cons. Clearly, fuel economy is a definite pro for the RAV4, as is the practical cargo area. We have that improved e-all-wheel drive system. That's a pretty big difference between this generation of the RAV4 and the one that preceded it. We have the improved ground clearance. It's nearly what we see in the Jeep Cherokee and in the Subaru Forester. So if you want to go a little bit off the beaten path in your hybrid, the RAV4 should have no problem there. Android Auto is missing for the moment from the infotainment system, but Toyota says that it will be coming soon, later in 2019. We don't know whether the existing models will be able to be patched, but I suspect that they probably will be. Also on the con side, we have the tighter back seat. We definitely don't have as much room as we find in the Nissan Rogue. That really is going to be noticeable if you plan on putting rear-facing child seats behind a taller driver. The RAV4's looks can be a little bit polarizing to some, although I find the new model to be relatively attractive. It's not CX-5 turbo attractive, but I think it's definitely more attractive than the last generation RAV4. The overall handling and stopping distances are a tiny bit behind some of the leaders in this segment, but I would really call this more of a pro than a con, depending on how you want to look at it, because the RAV4 overall does very, very well in the segment. It's definitely above average, but it's not up there at the top of the segment where we see some of the competition. I do think that a downside for the hybrid system is the lack of the front wheel drive version. That could be getting us even better fuel economy and it could potentially lower the sticker price of the RAV4, making it an even better deal and even more attainable. But for some reason, we don't see that in America at this point. And then the last thing again to keep in mind is the relative availability of the RAV4 because it has proved to be so popular. It's probably going to be the most popular Toyota hybrid. Finding a RAV4 on the dealer lot does seem to be a little bit tricky. If I were shopping for a compact crossover right now with my own money, instead of using Alex and Otto's company money to buy a car for a long-term video series, I have to say that I would be pretty torn between the RAV4 Hybrid and the Mazda CX-5. I would probably be looking at the top end trim of the RAV4 Hybrid, the limited trim, but the CX-5 Turbo is an awful lot of fun. It is gorgeous. It has that new turbocharged engine. Both of them are a little bit on the smaller side. On the inside, the RAV4 is a little bit more cargo practical and definitely considerably more fuel efficient. Be sure and let me know what you think about all that down there in the comment section below, and let me know what you would choose if you were shopping in this segment at around $30,000 or so, especially those base engine forms of the competition. So the Chevy Equinox, the Ford Escape, etc. 
Would you be willing to look at something like the RAV4 Hybrid and get that significantly higher fuel economy with the few compromises that we do see here on our list? Let me know what you think about that down there. Be sure and hit that subscribe button if you haven't already done so. Be sure and find us over at facebook.com slash alexnados, and I'll see you next week.